Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Okay, welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, I guess we've uh, we've gone through the primary elections uh, here within the state of Oregon and nationally, for that matter. But you know, we'll be looking at the general election, and so consequently, uh, we'll probably be having some major discussions. Now we're going to really get into the bouts. Now is the time to figure out what who's going to be elected and who we'll be looking for, and we'll be probably be recovering that. In fact, next week we'll probably be talking about uh, the results of the uh, of the primary. And then maybe maybe make some predictions with some, several people who will be sitting here at the table talking about what, what do we feel that is going to be happening in the general election and what are some of the major issues that we should be discussing. And uh, so maybe just as a pre, you know, as a preamp of this whole piece, I, I figured I'd take an area that uh, is of major concern, not only in the state of Oregon or the city of Portland, but even from a national perspective. And I'm talking about education. Uh, we've got a major issue in the education. People are constantly trying to figure out how, how do we solve the problem of making sure we educate the populace? And I'm talking about doing those formative years. And uh, the issue of, uh, of minorities, uh, English as a second language, and you go on and on and on. You know, we've, we've come up with things like charter schools and all kinds of things and whatever. But the fact of the matter is that during those formative years, if we don't educate the populace, we've got some very serious problems. And so what I'm going to do this particularly, uh, we just happen to have a young person who has gone through the system, uh, also his parent is here with me also too. He, uh, we've gone through the system, and he's got some very exciting, some interesting things to say, especially in those areas that uh, uh, young people are not given the opportunity, if you will, to be able to succeed like he was able to succeed. And uh, this is a very interesting piece. And so this is going to be his story, but out of his story, uh, we're going to probably be giving some examples of what we need to do to correct the system, if we can, one way or the other. But at least we're going to be aware. And I think that's going to be a major topic uh, within them as far as the election, uh, you know, et cetera. So uh, that's what we're going to do. And hopefully you'll keep an open mind and listen to the to the program, okay, and hear the program and see the program. Okay, so the, my guests today uh, are the point set. Is that, am I right? Am I correct? That's correct. Cool. Point set, point set, right? Point yeah. set. And uh, one one of which uh, happens to be his dad, Bruce Bruins. Said, you got a, I got a Bruce. We got three Bruces on the show. We got Bruce Bruins, said, we got Bruce, and they got another Bruce, Bruce Broussard, okay? But the bottom line is that his uh, dad and I, Bruce and I, we've, we, we've been knowing one another for a number of years, and, and uh, he's worked in the industry of construction, as you see on his byline and whatever. And... Um, and so anyway, um, uh, we've been talking for a number of years, and, and it just so happened his son was going to school, and, and mom is an educator and, 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 and the like, and I mean, his wife is an educator and the like, and, and, um, and so we've never really talked about this particular issue, and then all of a sudden one day uh, uh, I get introduced to his son uh, through an article that, uh, that appeared in the Oregonian, and I thought it was an interesting one. It's, it, it basically said... Um, my turn, essay on racism in Lake Oswego prompts wide-range response. And I thought that was a very interesting article. I'm not going to get too heavily involved in, in the article because that's why we're going to have, that's why we're having the show. And so, uh, so anyway, I've got, uh, I got young Bruce here uh, who's, uh, who actually went through this process. He's going to basically give us a feel for what, he, what that means, uh, essay on racism in Lake Oswego prompts wide-ranging response. And then some of you will probably probably Google this, that, and the other. You can Google down some of the other articles that appeared, whatever. But what I'm going to do this time around is give give him an opportunity uh, to uh, respond uh, to that article and uh, and at the same time uh, hopefully give uh, give Dad, Bruce, the opportunity uh, to, um, to relate uh, to what we're talking about today. So on that, why don't we start off by... Uh, let me introduce you. Bruce, how you doing? I'm doing fine. It's been some time. How's the job so far? We're working. I heard that. And and from your as far as your background is concerned, in terms of, you know, you're a safety instructor right here in the in the Portland metropolitan area, so to speak. So to speak, okay. yes, yeah. I am. And I know you're an instructor and I know you've been very much involved in the whole issue of, of education in many ways from the industry standpoint. Got me and gotten involved in a number of areas. Fair? Fair. Good, good, good. And then you've got your son here, Bruce. I want to make sure that we um, we introduce him and and, uh, and and 
and at this point in time and if you don't, would you mind just introducing him just for a moment well this is my son bruce right. a point okay. okay and um basically he's gone through the lake oswego school system and from there went to the university of oregon and graduated in june 2011 with a degree in journalism great fantastic wife right wife she is um principal of portland public school system Good, 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 good. All right, Bruce, let's just get right into this particular story. I, I notice it says, My turn essay on racism in Lake Oswego prompts wide range response. Uh, this was published, I guess, in April of 26 of 2012, right? Yep. Aspect of it. Let's just go down there and aspect of it. Well, first off, what inspired the, the, the essay? Well, the essay is actually the second part, and I did a essay actually in early in uh, March. Okay. Uh, after it was in response to an incident at Lake Oswego High School where a football player who had transferred in the winter, he, some other football players from the team, because this is a black football player, I should say, transferred to from Lake Oswego High School to the Lake Ridge, and some other football players on the team decided to go to a fake Twitter account mm -hmm. and post racist and demeaning tweets about him. And... When I saw the story on the news, I saw a number of people, including the principal, basically portray it as this is an isolated incident. They couldn't understand how something like this would happen. Mm -hmm. Almost as if, you know, something like these type of incidents never happened before. And immediately that sparked a response in me because I remember a specific incident as a, when I was a basketball player at Lake Oswego High School my sophomore year, in which we were playing Lincoln and there was a player that would go to the free throw line and for some reason our crowd decided to start chanting you can't read and hooked mm -hmm. on phonics and it was it was another one of these big incidents where you have this wide-ranging response and you get to see sort of a very uglier side of Lake Oswego than is normally portrayed and what I wanted to do with my essay was to show that there's actually a systemic problem. And I don't mean that to say to demonize or to condemn mm -hmm. a town or a whole group of people. What I'm trying to show is that there is a lack of understanding that a lot of people who don't have exposure specifically to people of color may not know what is and what isn't appropriate and how that also has an effect on students of color, whether it be from other students who may make them not feel comfortable in their settings, or even teachers who also have a lack of exposure and may not give them the opportunities they need to succeed in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, let's go back a minute in regards to you said Lake Oswego, right? And I'm sort of reminded that um, there was a there was a fact a professional basketball player by the name of Love at, at the time. I, it's my understanding that you were on the team with Love at the time during that time. Yeah, I played on the basketball team in my sophomore. I played on the varsity basketball team with them on my sophomore and junior years. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure you we, we, we understood that was that was that situation during that particular time. We maybe we'll come back to that a bit, or whatever. But let's talk about uh, let's go back in time in regards to uh, talk about uh, what, what what about some of the the background material on as you know about your about your family. You, you know, as far as as far as activism, you know, back in those days when they sort of sit down with you and say, son, let me tell you what, what I did during my particular time and, and my involvement and whatever. Well, my family has roots in the civil rights movement. We have, obviously, my most famous family member is Septima Poinsett Clark, who many consider the grandmother, the queen mother of the civil rights movement, hmm. which she was heavily involved in the Highlander School and essentially teaching people voting literacy. And where was that back then? And this was in right? South Carolina. South Carolina, okay. So she was, I said she was heavily involved in making sure people were registered to vote and, you know, passing, or I should say getting past, you know, the poll taxes and all of those things. And then also my grandfather was, helped build the first black hospital in South Carolina. So you have, like I said, my family has those roots and I try and take that with me because we have a, I know that their work allowed me to have opportunities where, you know, I could go to a good school, where I could be a college graduate, mm -hmm. and where I could have the opportunity to pursue 
you know, my aspirations as a writer. And where, where did mom and dad come in on that same in, in, in that arena? And my parents have been deeply involved as well. But they've been specifically here as far as in education. Obviously, my dad, you talked about earlier, right. he works in the construction, he works with teaching, and basically giving people the opportunities to succeed and try to give and really reach out to people of color to show them opportunities in the construction field where we're very underrepresented. Then my mother works in the Portland Public School District. She's worked really all over at some majority white schools, some more majority children of color. So she's been around it all. She's seen it all. Understanding all the issues are, et cetera. She was also very important as far as during my educational period, as far as she knows specifically, she knows the game because she works in education. Mm -hmm. So if I were ever being denied opportunities or whatever issues may come up, I, she, would be, she and my father would be pushing me even if I didn't think it was important or I mm -hmm. didn't see what the need was to take certain classes or really push teachers if they underestimated me. Now, mom, you said you said she was in the education business. I mean, she is she still in the in the yes. system? She's currently the principal of Humboldt School. She's retiring after this year. She's been in it for forty five years. In the Portland Public School? No, she's been in education. She's been in Portland since eighty six. Wow! But she's she started out back in New Jersey, actually. Wow, that's huge. That's huge. Well, now let's talk a little bit about now that you you've given that background aspect of it. What about your experience as a child? How far, can, how far back can you remember? And I'm sure that probably mom and dad probably kind of shared with you in, in a little bit, and maybe dotted some of the eyes in the early, early years, right? Mm -hmm. but how did I mean, how's it? Well, the first instant, I, I can't specifically remember. My mom, my mom remembers it crystal clear, because mm -hmm. she had to pick me up that day, was in the sandbox back when I was in preschool. And for some reason... How old were you about that time? How about how old were you? say probably like four or five maybe. Four or five, okay. And I guess some other white students just basically trapped me in the sandbox and started throwing sand on me and calling me chocolate or chocolate chip cookie mm -hmm. over and over again. And like I said, I can't, I don't remember that one specifically, but... Was this local? Was this in Oregon? Yeah, this was, I was going to Touchstone Elementary at the time. And where is that at? Important public That's in... It's in Lake Oswego. Lake Oswego, okay. In the Mountain Park area. It's mm -hmm. a private school. Mm -hmm. So you had that incident, I guess, was the first thing I can remember where we had you know, a racial incident, quote unquote. And then, as far as the years that are more formative for me that I can remember, in preschool, I had, there was basically like two kids that were the quote unquote different kids. Is I was the black student, then you had another girl who I think she only had three fingers on one hand, hmm. and so we were sort of separated as sort of like obviously you know the others in the classroom, but and you know sometimes that would result in you know being just separated off, maybe not being given certain opportunities, and I guess probably the best example of that would <coughs> come in when I was in kindergarten actually. Because there was a time when the teachers or the teacher was basically giving us all reading lessons, and what she would do was when it came time when it came time for reading during the day, there was me, and then there was also another Saudi Arabian exchange student, and she basically told us we could go over in the corner and play with blocks while she was teaching the other kids to read. Hmm. The result being. When it came to be reading night, which is where the students come up and they show off their reading for all the parents, mm. and you know it's a big event. So when I got up there, I could barely put words out, and obviously it was embarrassing for me. And what grade were you? What, what this grade? was kindergarten. It's still kindergarten. Yeah. So this is embarrassing for me. This is embarrassing for my family, and you know, I think that's about when they found out. Because as a kindergartner, if you're told that you have the choice between learning or playing, yeah. you're gonna play. You're, gonna play. <laughs> uh, you're, you're a little kid, you don't understand any of this. So, like, I didn't tell my parents about this because I didn't really think about it, but mm -hmm. after that night, they found out something's wrong, mm -hmm. and I have to give them so much credit in the world because they spent every night 
countless hours. And you have to understand, my parents are work, both working two very stressful full-time jobs as mm -hmm. well. But they're spending countless hours every night working with me to k get me up to speed and reading so that you know I can get through kindergarten because even because despite the teacher you know not really making an active effort and almost really making an active effort for me not to learn she actually suggested to my mom at the end of kindergarten that I'd be held back which yeah if you think about it, is just cynical in so many ways so not just but not just was I not held back in kindergarten with the help of my parents I was able by first grade and also I had a great first grade teacher named Mrs. McGuire at the time I wouldn't want to leave her out and saying that by the time I was done with first grade I was one of the advanced students in the class hmm. and that was just all because of just some special attention and just focus and giving me an opportunity to be a learner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that motivation, I think it came around because you were improving, right? Oh, absolutely. You were improving. And, once and I saw that, you know, I could, once I saw that I could be successful, that's mm -hmm. really when I started taking off. Mm -hmm. I noticed you, you also talked about the wordly wise. What does, what does that, how, how does that yeah. Well, wordly wise, was, there are these books that basically work on you know, vocabulary. They do a little bit of spelling, a little bit of word puzzles. And basically just, like I said, try and expand your knowledge of words. And what we had was when I was at Touchstone, because I transferred from Touchstone after third grade to Forest Hills, which is a public school. And when I was in the second and third grade, we were doing Wordly Wise books at Touchstone. And I gotten through what was, I think, Wordly Wise book three when I was in third grade. And then this would come back to me at six in sixth grade at Forest Hills because they were reintroducing Wordly Wise to us at that level. And the teacher wanted to put me in book three, which as I just mentioned, I had finished in third grade. In fact, I still had the book with all my work in it completely filled out. So we had to really push the teacher because I guess she just, because we had different groups. There was, you know, the lower level group, the intermediate group, the advanced group, mm -hmm. and book three was sort of the intermediate group, and that's just where she placed me, even mm -hmm. though I had done the work, but I guess that's just where she assumed I would be. Even though, mom and dad was involved, and then you, you got them involved in the process. Oh, yes, my parents, my parents were basically not going to have it, mm -hmm. so what happened, however, what happened was basically the teacher decided she was going to give me a, work out a little deal with us, where if I got 100% on every test with book three for five straight weeks, I could move on to the advanced group. Keep in mind, there was already another person in the advanced group. She, she didn't have to get 100% on five tests. And if you have to ask yourself, what well, if you're getting 100% on five tests in a row, that's beyond <laughs> you know competent, that's, that's mastery, <laughs> basically. So, Nonetheless, I did, I did do that. I got, I did get a hundred percent. I don't think once I got into the advanced group, I don't think I got anywhere below a ninety on any of the tests. Hmm. So I think I sufficiently proved myself. However, I do have a little issue in the sense that I essentially wasted five weeks of where I could have been learning, mm -hmm. doing something I already did three years ago. Wow. And I noticed one thing on this talented and gifted, you know, the TAG program, you hear about this quite some time. But to understand it, I noticed there was a note I made here was in regards to the, uh, you, you didn't look like a TAG kid. What is that? How did that come about? Well, this was a uh, seventh grade where it's interesting because I actually got introduced to TAG in fourth grade. And, you know, a lot of that came from my mother also pushing because they didn't really think I was TAG material. But... You know, my mom pushed and gave me the opportunity, so I got to work with TAG in fourth grade. And then we got back to Lake Oswego Junior High in seventh grade, and we are talking with the TAG program there, and I guess my mother had a conversation with the counselor, and the counselor told her I didn't look, quote-unquote, like a TAG kid, <laughs> which begs the question, what does a TAG kid look like? I mean, I've, I've proven, as we just talked about with Worldly Wise and with spelling, I've proven... I was one of the advanced students in school. I was in advanced math at the time. 
I'd actually in sixth grade won an award for writing an essay from the Masonic Lodge. So, I mean, I don't know what their criteria was for talented and gifted, but we thought I was there and we had to push once again, and you know, push and battle and fight with them. But I was able to get in hmm, eventually. You know, another issue, another major issue, is is the, the lack of, of of culture material in the in the in the school system, if you will. You know, whether it be African American, they don't even the whole nine yards. When was that was that part of the of the curriculum? Did, did, were you introduced to to cultural material? And if not, uh, how did you? How was you? How were you introduced to it? Well, the funny thing about, I guess you say, culturally specific education is that for a lot of time. I was really like, I was the black history teacher almost, even at very young years. Cause I would think about it when I was really young, you know, I wanted to blend in. Mm -hmm. I was being a black student. I already got all the extra attention in the world. You know, everyone was just doing things like feeling your hair, mm -hmm. all those types of things. So it's like, I was tired of standing out. I didn't really have a sense of myself and my identity, but my parents were always pushing me for every book report we did like i may have wanted to do some white person like all the other students were doing but they said no we're gonna have you do jackie robinson mm -hmm. you know we're gonna have you do tucson and this is a teacher no this, this is my parents these are your parents these Not are the my teachers. Pa no the teacher the teachers that that wasn't really their concern i guess that wasn't really their priority but like I said, my parents really pushed that. Okay. So every every lesson I would do, like if we're doing a book report, we're doing a history lesson, whatever it is, when I come out there, I'm the one who's basically giving the black history or giving off, you know, the, not the I wouldn't say the black perspective, but showing off a black perspective as well. And so you're introducing and teaching to the, to the teachers. About culture. I mean, I I would I would like to be uh, hopeful, hopeful, and say that maybe they knew these things. They just weren't bringing them up in class because, you know, some people talk about time. I I guess I'll be optimistic about it. I don't want to say what was going on in their mind, but at the same time, yes, I was the one who was bringing these lessons. I didn't. I mean, it's something I didn't really realize until later on in my life that you know no one else is doing this. If if I wasn't out there giving these just giving these book reports mm -hmm. that would be that much less exposure exposure to black culture than these students already would have had and i don't know something as far as culturally specific education i think for all my parents pushing it finally really clicked the importance to me about in seventh grade when you know I, a lot of it also came through music and just who i was listening to at the time i started listening to like groups like Public Enemy, for instance, that really pushed, you know, black culture mm -hmm. and, you know, knowledge of self. So that helped as well. And I started reading more and I started really actually also taking off to another level in my education to where I can now put it in a context mm -hmm. of who I was. Like I started reading this book, Forced into Glory by Lerone Bennett Jr. talking about Abraham Lincoln and a lot of things you didn't know about Abraham Lincoln because and also just about specifically some of the things we think about with the Emancipation Proclamation and we don't learn as much about the 13th Amendment which is actually what freed black people mm -hmm. because the Emancipation Proclamation put more black people back in slavery than it freed mm -hmm. and a lot of people a lot of people don't know that mm -hmm. so it was learning facts like that just sparked my interest like this is why I read mm -hmm. this is why I learn and I'd start reading, I started, was it Forced in the Glory? I started reading stuff by Cornell West, uh, Ivan Van Sertema, the historian, read the autobiography of Malcolm X, Roots, you know, all, all these books. And it just, it changed me to where, like, or I was a good writer before and I had won that award, but by eighth grade, when I was starting to write, not just about, you know, the topics they were giving me, but I could choose my own things and write about something that related to me and my self-identity. And my teacher responded well, classmates responded well. Even if they disagreed, 
it made it made the conversation it made the dialogue in class more rich mm-hmm, mm-hmm. now now where do we go from here now you're in the seventh grade at this time at this particular time yeah, right seventh eighth grade and that's my understanding you were also introduced to the local newspaper you i guess there was some sort of a contest and you were given the opportunity to write for the local newspaper and make us very good reviews. Well, actually, that, that came a little bit later. That came in my junior year of high school. Junior, okay. Because uh, my sophomore my sophomore English teacher, or say my sophomore honors English teacher, had recommended a few students from the class because they were looking for a student columnist at the Lake Oswego Review. So we all went into the interview obviously. Now was that standard practice was that a first or was it oh no that, uh, that's how they do it basically every year for, uh, doing that for incoming years. juniors okay essentially are given that opportunity well, actually they do some incoming juniors and seniors as well okay but basically you have a few students that are recommended they get a shot in the interview and so I wanted to think about what's going to give me the best opportunity to get hired right what what separates <laughs> me from these other students I happen to have this perspective, literally this culturally conscious perspective, that when I, you know, displayed that in the interview, when I came with, you know, a story about culture, and it really it wowed them because they weren't really getting that from the other students. They hadn't really had that before, as far as student columnist. So I was given, so I got the job, and I got that opportunity, and you know. What transpired was really, I think, what got me into writing as far as thinking about it in a way, in a career, Mm -hmm. as far as a career path. Because I was writing a lot of socially conscious columns. I was writing about current events. Like, example. Like, like I think my first article was about Katrina. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, obviously, like, there was national events, but I'd also do stuff that was local, such as one article I wrote was about having more black books in the curriculum because not just for something for me to identify with but also because a lot of the books we were reading a lot of a lot of the kids whether black white brown whatever they didn't really they just couldn't get into it it was a lot of these i guess really older like books like the scarlet letter Mm -hmm. that just quite frankly put a lot of kids to sleep and they (laughs) they didn't want they were just sick of it so when yeah when I wrote that article I got a big response as I did with a lot of articles I wrote during that time which as I found out was rare for a student columnist because everyone was telling me you know that no one has wrote letters to the editor about what a student columnist was saying I haven't got I think my favorite uh, piece of you know mail I got was someone telling me that they appreciated me they didn't always agree with me but they liked that I wasn't writing, quote unquote, my dog Jake stories. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that particular note, on my dog Jake story, we're going to take a short break and we're going to, we're going to continue this, this interview with Bruce, okay? Take a short break. We'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
and as you note, uh, we're interviewing this young man in regards to uh, his experience and his exposure, if you will, doing that educational system. If you'll notice, there were uh, the commitment by parents, a very, very important ingredients in this whole issue of, of uh, doing those formative years, how, how so important it is for parents to be involved uh, with, their, with their kids. And uh, that's been a problem today because uh, we were talking to the offset, uh, Bruce and I, we've mentioned this before, and all due respect, babies having babies, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of the kids were lacking today. They don't, they're lacking the family structure, if you will, to, to be to be supportive, if you will, uh, during those formative years, which is very, very important. But anyway, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, so we're back here now. We got Bruce. He's got he's got his dad here, Bruce, another Bruce. Okay, and we sort of mentioned about this history thing, and we were just kind of talking it off uh, when we were off for a moment. And uh, Bruce brought up an idea, and I wanted him to share that with you. Bruce, what what was that history? Well, typically speaking, in the school system, history, be it called Black history be it called Negro history, whatever. It appears in a lot of instances that the time period starts in about 1954, 1955. Mm -hmm. People think about the bus boycott, which immediately brings to mind Rosa Parks, and they work forward. There doesn't seem to be that much emphasis or information given on things that have happened prior. And one of the things I brought up to you uh, was the fact that I think most of most of the people do not know the histories of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. They do not realize the history behind the Buffalo Soldiers, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. which I know that you can speak to quite well. Oh, very much so, Bruce. I, I appreciate the, I appreciate the little in, intro opportunity. But you know, for instance, a lot of people don't realize that whites were also Buffalo Soldiers. So I'm saying, well, you got to be kidding me. Well, during that particular period, uh, you couldn't be an officer. You see what I mean? You could be an officer in the Buffalo Soldiers. Officers were white. So as far as I'm concerned, they were Buffalo soldiers. You, you know, it's an inclusionary kind of a deal. Make them be a part of that whole deal because that's what it's all about. It's as if to say we, we have been sort of like, uh, uh, there's been a divide, if you will. We weren't a part of America. You know, we were America uh, because during that Civil War, we fought for this country, for the stars and the stripes, if you will. And, uh, and not too often, it, 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 it throw out the Buffalo soldiers, put them on the side, just a bunch of blacks, you know, blah, 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 you know, a bunch of slaves fighting or whatever. No. We, we were we were union armies, you know. What I mean, we were there fighting, if you will, for this country, and and that's why I make that point that white white officers, whites were also buffalo soldiers in the roundabout way. But thanks for that opportunity, appreciate that. Now we're going to get back to to Bruce. That's another piece you might want to do a little research on. Check that out because you know people talk about uh, restitution, you know, that that kind of a piece and aspect. They've been doing that particular days. The forty acres and the mule was real. In, during the Civil War. So, I mean, if a person signed up, white or whatever, they signed up to, and they served for a certain period of time, they got paid. They, they was paid during that particular time. 40 acres and a mule. The mule was kind of like the tractor, <laughs> and the acres, i.e., you know, agri agribusiness aspect of it and the business. And uh, too often people don't realize that if you, if you saw the movie Glory, Remember, with mm -hmm. Denzel Washington, whatever, they were all signing, right? They signed up. Those records are sitting up there in Washington, D.C. And, you know, what happened to that 40 acres in the mule? <laughs> See what I mean? No one talks about that side of stuff. So anyway, that's, that's, another, that's another piece. But that's something maybe, I, maybe our uh, uh, journalist here might be able to look into. It might, might, might strike his interest. I noticed I got his eye for a minute or two. Well, look, right before we broke, you were also talking about, uh, you know, as you, as you were going through school and this, that, and the other, and now you're you're going through the seventh and seventh grade or better, and and, and you're kind of a junior now. But you were talking about your you know what what you, what you really wanted to do, the writing aspect of it. But you were also playing basketball during that particular time, right? Well, I would say obviously being a kid, being a high school age kid, you're having fun, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was having fun. I'd say basketball is probably like my number one focus. To my parents' chagrin, sometimes. But okay. Okay. But that was that was really where I spent a lot of my time. Whether I spent hours in the gym, mm -hmm. spent hours just watching games, you know, analyzing games. What position did you play? What? Oh, cra crazily, I've, even though I've maxed out at six two, I've played center. Which, if you're looking at high school players at the time, is your position you're about to be more like six five, six mm. six to play, but. You know, one my thing was just playing hard because that was the only way I was going to get the opportunity. And also, mm -hmm. I I grew up I had my growth spurts when I was early early on in life, 
So I was close to the height I am now in about seventh grade. Interesting. Oh. So I was, I used to be, you know, I thought I was going to be seven feet tall back in like third grade <laughs> just because I towered over all the kids and that, that dream ended quickly. Mm-hmm. But, you know, so I learned how to play center. Shaquille O'Neal was my favorite player and I mm-hmm. modeled my game after him, mm-hmm. which is, is easy to do. Like I said, if you're very, if you are seven feet tall and 300 pounds, mm-hmm. So I had to obviously remold my game, and I happened to come a lot of coaches that I was lucky, you know, to meet first in my team? lifetime. First team, you were the first team. Uh, no, no, I was a. Uh, I mean, I was. Where's sorry. love? Where's love in, in that piece? Uh, when did he? When? Kevin comes into the picture in high school, about sophomore year, because before I I played on mostly like B teams in junior high and then mm-hmm. I played on the freshman team mm-hmm. I said when I was a freshman obviously and then my sophomore year I happened to work with this coach Combino Memory who does Hoop Dreams basketball mm-hmm. who really did a lot as far as instilling confidence in me and also expanding me past you know before I played you know the Shaq big large man game and he taught me a lot as far as trying to have more guard skills and being a more versatile player so that and that helped me, so where I could be playing, you know, a little bit of varsity basketball by my sophomore year. Even mm-hmm. though, as a freshman, there were some people who didn't think I was even going to make that team. Mm-hmm. I ended up leading that team in scoring, just as a side. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I spent, like I said, I spent countless hours. I did with hoop dreams. I did probably, yeah, two work. I do the workouts with you know the kids my age and the college people. Mm-hmm. And occasionally, some pros would come mm-hmm. in. I'd also do the second workout after that with like the younger kids, just so I could get some more time in there and you know get some more shots up. And then you know I'd go home and do just some insane amount of like five hundred, six hundred push-ups and watching basketball. So you were games. destined. You were destined. I to be in the ball, playing ball. I, that what, was that what was changed? my focus. What happened? It was just, you know, you find out in high school basketball that a lot of, even though it's a sport we all, we love and everything like that, you start finding out that there's a really heavy business aspect to it as well. And there's a little, you know, political aspect, if you will. And what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that political piece? Well, basically, if you have certain parents have certain power Hmm. and, you know, they're going to do whatever they can to make sure their children are playing and their yeah. their interests are taken care of because mm-hmm. everyone everyone wants to see oh, yeah. their oh, yeah, their yeah. children succeed and if you have the means to do it you'll do whatever you can do so you know I to have, at LO you have a lot of these interests as well and you come across that so what I found was actually had other outside influences who wanted me really were really suggesting that I transfer because they saw even no matter what I do as far to play as ball. yeah to play ball and they want me to transfer basically because no matter how much work I may have been doing something might come up where if it's between me and say someone whose parents have more power mm-hmm. the person whose parents have more more power they're going to get the edge mm-hmm. like if it's a tie it's going to go to them mm-hmm. so you know, I had forces trying to get me to transfer, and you know, for a while, I really, I was really considering it, really, almost like pushing my parents to do that. But first off, there's obviously the ethical aspect of it, mm-hmm. and whereas while it happens very commonly, my parents didn't want to be a part of that. First off, and secondly, there was the part that I was going to Lake Oswego High School, which is one of the top schools in the state Mm -hmm. academically and if you look at if you go and apply to a college and you got a certain grade point average at Lake Oswego High it's going to look different than some other schools like Portland Public Schools yeah a lot of Portland Public Schools basically because the only and why is that why is that well it's just it's resources like I'll give you an example when you drive around Lake Oswego you often see a lot of signs that say excellence has a price support the LO Schools Foundation, donate. And 
like obviously you have a lot of people in Lake Oswego that do have means and do have the ability to donate a lot of money to the schools whereas in some in some more low income areas in Portland you don't have that and you don't see those same signs planted everywhere you go in Portland public schools like when I drive around my mom's school which like she teaches at Hum- or she's a principal at Humboldt and it's right across from Jefferson you got two schools right there you don't see those signs just because it's it's different and the people that do have the means as we said before are going to use them to their best advantage because they want to provide the best for their children well they, they know the reasoning I mean they know they understand the reasoning if you will for a better education during those formative years right mm-hmm. and that that's the issue and, and, I, and your parents recognize that right off the bat right Bruce correct you know, that's a very serious situation Okay, so now you 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 know you, you, you we've transferred we've transferred now. Now you're going to college. Where you what's what's the deal now? You you're in college now, right? Yeah. You went to I went to the University of Oregon. I graduated last June, and I because of uh, my time as a writer with the Lake Oswego Review, I decided I was going to go into journalism. So, you know, I was. Studying. Why not basketball? You could have gone to U of O and played some ball there. Well, actually, I didn't. I'd actually kind of given up on basketball just because of, you know, some of the other pressures and Did mom just, and dad have anything to do with that? No, that that was entirely my decision. Okay. In which I said that, you know, I was just tired of certain things and I wanted to I just wanted to experience a different side of life, have I guess more of a social life mm-hmm. really. So I took my senior year off. I did more to focus on actually getting into college, making visits, doing that sort of thing. And it was, I said, I made the transition into college and I was studying journalism, although I didn't really, I wouldn't say I got serious about studying journalism until I got a couple of years into college where I, I took a lot of my general requirements beforehand and sort of, you know, soaked in the college lifestyle. I was in a fraternity for a little bit. I just... You know, I was doing that sort of thing. But then I think what really changed me was that, you know, I started getting exposure to, well, back, it came back to that knowledge of self and culturally specific education. Mm-hmm. I took this class, uh, was it race, class, ethnic groups. It was, it, was a, it was a sociology class, basically. We were discussing, or I hadn't really had any other classes really discussing race like that. I had African American history. And it wasn't, you know, I have a friend who was in that class with me who always joked that it was just a terrible class, hmm. the way they taught it. And that it was amazing that we were still able to come in out what with way? some things. In what way, if you were to? It was just, uh, it wasn't engaging. Hmm. Like, it was, it covered, you know, sort of just like a broad stroke of things. It didn't really delve deep into it. And it didn't really allow us to interact with it in a way that would make it, you know, engaging to the students. Mm-hmm. But then I took this, like I said, I took this sociology class my junior year in which we did a lot of, uh, we did a lot of, you know, discussions, the student led discussions where we're talking about our own experiences as well as providing a historical context, as well as talking about theories. So it's giving us, you know, an opportunity actually engage with the material mm-hmm. and talk about our experiences and I remember there was one student in the class who was particularly vocal his name was Tyree Harris who I found out he was actually a columnist for the student newspaper later on but because before I'd been very uh, sort of very just a quiet student I was in the class you know I soaked it in but I didn't really engage and I saw him and I saw others like really engaging and really pushing and not just, you know, just being passive participants in the class. And it sort of gave me that example of like, you know, I don't just have to be, just have to be here. Hmm. I can actually be, you know, an active part. I can be, you know, I can be, uh, influence the classroom instead of, like I said, just be a passive participant. And it would actually come around full circle later on, before my senior year, when I decided that I wanted to get into, 
I wanted to get some clips basically because I hadn't, I hadn't written for the paper. I hadn't, you know, I'd just been in classes, but I didn't have any clips for when I was actually going to go out into the real world mm-hmm. and try and be a journalist. So I decided the best way to do that would be if I could write for the student newspaper or the big student newspaper, which is the Oregon Daily Emerald. And Tyree happened to be the opinion editor at the time because mm-hmm. I had applied a couple of times before and it hadn't worked out for one reason or the other. But for some reason, when I applied with him and he saw that I had this perspective and I brought a lot of the stuff I brought to the Lake Oswego Review when I was writing for them, and he, and he saw an opportunity in that. And I said, gave, gave me, me opportunity. Yeah, basically gave me an opportunity. Mm-hmm. And what transpired was a lot of the same stuff that happened when I was writing for the Lake Oswego Review, Mm -hmm. in which I was writing things that were controversial. I was covering political events. And and I was showing this perspective from, as really, I guess, a quote-unquote black perspective. And people were really engaged with it. Obviously, I had a lot of people that didn't like what I was saying, but... The thing with the media is, That's you're, the way it is. yeah. <laughs> the, best thing, the thing with the media is that if it's almost better to have people that hate you than to have people that love you. Negative you, sales. Yes, it does. <laughs> like those, those are your most loyal fans. I had yes. one person who responded to every article I wrote. He went under the pseudonym Bruce, yeah. ironically, and it was always something. He called, I think he called me the Wicked Witch of the West one time. Yeah, yeah. It was just. He didn't like anything I had to say, but if I count, if I could count on one loyal reader, it was him. Well, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't use the N word. No, you, you're in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're you're a legitimate journalist, as far as I'm concerned, from that standpoint. Okay, good, good, good job, good job. Well, now you're graduated. Now you're graduated, and uh, do you put your feelers out? And uh, did they have a? Did they have the sort of kind of like career day or something like that? Where, you're able to go out and meet the meet the various entities like the Oregonian, like OMPA, Oregon Newspapers Association. Did you send out your send out your resumes and whatever? Well, I when I came out, I tried to, you know, get attached with certain newspapers, and you know, I had I saw a lot of people like our publisher, the Daily Emerald, Ryan Frank, hooked me up with a lot of people. And the problem is, I guess just a lot of uh, news organizations because money is so tight and because you know, just the nature of news is changing right now. They're not really in positions as far as hiring. Mm. Like most of what I found was that you can get freelance opportunities. So one of the things I want to do is if I have this freedom as a freelancer Mm -hmm. is take advantage of it. So I did a blog called Chickle Down Truth in which there was a while back in the summer where I was, I had something every day. I might write about a book one day. I might write about music I might just do something like I did in the Daily Emerald and talk about current events. Hmm. I might talk about things going on in the community. Hmm. I just, I really wanted to have, you know, just a wide range of things so that if anyone saw me, they were like, Bruce can do this, this, this. Still got that blog? I still do have that blog. Would you throw throw, throw the logo out there? The the blog blog is Trickle Down Truth. It's at www.brucepointset.com. And... Yeah, you can find it, Google it. Mm-hmm. Just Google Bruce points at Google trickle down truth. Okay, so now you're out. You've been out since how long? I've been out since June 2011. 2011, June 2011. So what are you doing now? Right now I'm doing freelance writing. Most of my writing has been with the Scanner News Group. They actually, as I said, I had the blog and I went and pitched the, just basically offered my services to them in about August and you know they had they didn't have something right away immediately but I made a good name for myself and they said you know we'll keep you in mind we'll give you the opportunity and about uh, September came around or actually no, October came around and they took me on as a freelance writer and ever since I've been basically covering events in the north northeast Portland community and you know, doing it's about an article a week, I'd say, for them as well as I've had a couple other opportunities with the Oregonian. Okay. And you know, I've just been feeling around other services. I was able to actually edit a book for a woman just through you know my work with the scanner. So you know, I've just had 
miscellaneous opportunities mm-hmm. as a writer, which has been obviously it's good and bad. You don't always have the stability, but at the same time, you know, it puts your name out there and it gives you experience. And yeah, it's been it's been fun. Well, you know, when when you think about this, and Dad's sitting right here too. I mean, I'm sure he he I mean he really appreciates the fact that you. Not only he was part of this, but he, he was part and parcel. He and his wife, uh, you know, he, he, and my, he and mom were part and parcel of, of creating you. You know what I mean? And and uh, the fact that uh, the whole business about basketball and and your true career in terms of journalism, you selected you selected journalism, and uh, that's another major issue. And uh, I, I I thought that was interesting. And but the fact of the matter is your story. I mean, it, it can touch on many of us. Touch on me and Bruce and I. We've talked about this before, and there are a number of folks that are out there. Some of which didn't have the family background, you know, the the, the support. Uh, some might have achieved for whatever reason. A lot of times, sports is normally the way that most achieve if they don't have the the so the so-called background of middle-class families, if you will. You know, some folks achieve, and you'll find that a lot in the sports arena. You know, with guys that make it, you know, because they just got those skills, you know, those physical skills, if you will, in many ways. But, um, but I, I think hopefully that uh, the viewing audience can, can really appreciate what you shared with us today. I mean, we really can appreciate that, and and they could pretty well uh, maybe get the enthusiasm, if you will, to get back into their kids, and and hopefully the school districts, if you will, in those respective areas will understand the lack, if you will, of, of motivating young people during those formative years to, to succeed. We need that. We need it badly. And we're struggling. Trust me, we're struggling. When I, the, I, and I make this point again. I mean, I mean, charter school would never have come up, if you will, if in fact we were doing the job in the public school system. The public school system is really, that's the backbone of this country. And folks are sort of like tearing it down. And my definition of charter school from day one was the fact that, you know, all due respect, that some folks who were sending their kids to private school and, you know, we went through this whole business about the money followed the kids. And they basically said, well, we're going to challenge that piece. And the next thing you know, uh, uh, we got all these charter schools and, and people not focusing on the public school system aspect of it. And the public school system, people were educated, they got degrees, they, I mean, on and on and on and on. That, that, that whole system was to do just that, to give the best education that money could buy, if you will, but not still. Now this is just divide, and people are lobbying. To, no, you you don't need to worry about charter the, the public school system. We need to have a charter school. They're not doing their job on and on. No one wants to fix it. No one wants to fix it. And so, so I really appreciate what you're saying. And again, like I said to the viewing audience, uh, uh, I hope you appreciate what Bruce had to share with us. Uh, and if you've got kids that are still in school. Uh, look at it. Uh, kind of get us get, get take take a little bit more attention to to your your respective uh, kids and and making sure they succeed. We got through K through K twelve. We got K one to K twelve. I saw an article on on the, just lately on the D Bernardis. I understand the gentleman is retiring. Who he was on the front page of the the, the, the daily the, the Tribune Daily Tribune, and uh, I can still remember Doctor D. Uh, at the time, but uh, the fact of the matter is, my definition of Dr. D in, in Portland, as far as its community college, was that he took Voc Ed out of the high school. And you can see the demise that we have today. He took Voc Ed out of the high school. Now, we, we just have a super high school, as far as I'm concerned, the community college. But still, I say, okay, fine, it's here. So why don't we include it in the formative years? Rather than K1 to K12, that's included from K1 to 14, K14. So meaning that everyone graduates with a degree, associate degree, okay? They can mix with the students. They got employers are sending their folks back for retraining and whatever, and so maybe they might be able to pick up those blue-collar jobs and all. You know, I can go on and on and on, but I'm just reacting to what, you, what you've what you done and, and the fact that your parents were there, and uh, you were successful in your own way, but it was, again, it was because of your, your parents, and at the time you went to a, a good school system, the Lake Oswego school district, even though there might be in all these other issues, but the fact that they had the best because they had middle class and, a be- and better folks who were concerned about that education of their kids, respective kids. You don't have that in the rest of the area. So hopefully now that the governor of the state of Oregon, Governor Kitzhopper, is now taking the lead, they've done away with the superintendent of schools for the state, so now he is the, the super superintendent and hopefully he too 
will uh, will be. I hope that I think that's his concern about making sure that every child is given the opportunity to get the best education there is, as a, I'm saying, across the board on the same on the same situation. So, so anyway, this has been good. I think I can go on and on. Bruce and I, we're going to take it from this point on. Now that you're there, you're successful in your own rights and. And so I would hope that any, any employee out there, whether it be the Oregonian, Willamette Week, or Tribune, or anybody else, there he is. He's a heck of an apprentice right here. There's a guy who, who knows, he, he knows what he's doing. He's at the background, and all he needs is the opportunity. Because success is when opportunity meets preparation. The man is prepared, and, and, he, and he's got the, and he, the opportunity is there. Okay, so here you got, you got a good, good, you got a hell of an apprentice right now. And since money is tight, they don't have to pay you that thirty or forty dollars an hour to start with. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you understand that, right? Yes, I do. Okay, good, good. So, Bruce, think, is there anything else you want to say, real quick, man? Well, I just want to touch on the point you made that my story. I want to emphasize that my story isn't unique. Okay. That whether you be whether you live in a predominantly white area or whether you're in really any area with predominantly people of color, you have students of color young specifically young specifically young who go through this where it is lack of opportunity mm -hmm. and as like i said i want to make sure that people understand that as you point out that i had parents that were pushed and i had other outside influ influences that really pushed to make sure that i took advantage of any opportunity i could get and that's really how you get success as a student. Okay. Well, Bruce, thank you very much. Any any last comment? But from did? me, I think he summed it up quite well. I think I'm sure Mom, Mom would be just as proud, right? Right. Okay. Good. Well, folks, this has been great. I I really appreciate this this program, and and again here at Oregon at the uh, at the, at Community Television. I mean, it was brought to you by Community Television. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, you can share this with uh, with others, and as you know, we're on YouTube. And please understand what that's all about and get it out to your folks okay hey have a good one as george page always said back to what you believe in have a good one folks <laughs>